I'm Bart van Ark, and I'm the Managing Director of the Productivity Institute and a Professor of Productivity Studies here at the Alliance Manchester Business School. I'm so excited to see you business leaders participating in our journey to improve productivity across the UK. In solving the productivity puzzle, we need to work on different sectors, different regions, different types of companies, and we won't be able to do that without you. We need to hear your voice, as we do in our eight regional productivity forums, where we interact with many business executives around the nation, most of whom are actually joining us today. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I would like to briefly speak to you about why productivity matters for you. Because let's be honest, for most of you who are business leaders, productivity is not the thing that keeps you awake at night. There are many things to worry about, so that productivity issues you either delegate to your operational people who work on your company's processes, help you save cost and improve efficiency. Or you leave it to your R&D, innovation and marketing leaders who develop new processes, invent new products and services and bring them to market. Or maybe productivity is just something that happens outside your firm. The quality of the schools who bring your future workforce, the state of the infrastructure in your region, or the ease or difficulty in accessing existing and new markets. While all these factors are important, the reality is that you are in the middle of it. Productivity is largely done in the private and public sector companies in our economy. It's you who build and bring all the resources together in developing successful organizations that create the maximum value for your customers. Economics Nobel Prize winner Paul Krugman once said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long term, it's almost everything. That doesn't make it much easier. If it's almost everything, how should you prioritize what matters most? Especially if not all factors that matter for productivity are within your control. And long-term focus is hard when short-term pressures dominate. We want to assure you that you shouldn't feel lonely on your productivity journey. For example, firms in your supply chain are critical to your productivity performance. Firms in your region can help in creating hubs for regional innovation and talent. Governments can help, sometimes by supporting you, sometimes by getting out of the way. Schools and colleges are the source of your future workforce. Indeed, your employees are the asset most critical to productivity. Their motivation, their skills, their incentives, it all matters. So join us in this concerted effort with academia, business and policy to find solutions for our productivity puzzle. Figure out what works and what does not. Or, as the title of our keynote speech today says, how to go from here to there. Indeed, our keynote speaker this morning has been there, and he's here now, at least virtually. Of course, he's an iconic business leader, and one who has lived productivity for his own business, as well as for the economy. Sir Charlie Meerfeld was chairman of the John Lewis Partnership from 2007 to 2020. During that time, he was also chairman of the UK Commission for Employment and Skills. In 2015, he was asked by Chancellor Osborne to dig deeper into Britain's productivity problem, and that led to the launch of Be The Business, an organization that brings together companies, large and small, to make UK the home to the most ambitious firms in the world. Today, Sir Charlie is the chairman of Be The Business, an organization that we at the Productivity Institute are partnering with. Sir Charlie, thank you for joining us today, and the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Bart. And it's uh, really great to have uh, the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, as I think the video has just said really clearly, uh, for most of the last 10 years, productivity has been described as a puzzle. Essentially, we've been trying to figure out why is it that after years of steady growth up until about 2007, uh, it's stagnated and with it, so have wages and actually to an extent competitiveness ever since. And then now, um, with the year that we've just had, uh, that puzzle is being replaced, to be honest, with something that looks much more like a jungle, um, a productivity jungle, you know, with the disruption that we've seen in economic activity, in society, in businesses up and down the country, um, along with massive government intervention. It's actually harder than ever to see what is going on. Now, what we can see is that some things are clearly changing. Uh, inflation has ticked up. Many employers are struggling to find staff. Uh, wages uh, will probably rise. And maybe productivity will too. 
But what no one really knows is if all these changes are a blip or they're a lasting trend. And in any case, what really matters is not whether productivity rises a little bit or for a while. What we're looking for is a sustained increase in productivity uh, that grows and continues uh, for many, many years from here on. And, and I think uh, as, as the video made very clear, uh, there's an awful lot depending on it. Now, my belief is that absolutely that is possible. Um, there's, uh, there's, it's really important that we achieve it, as uh, we just said, for economic reasons, for social reasons, for competitiveness. Um, but whether we do it or we don't do it, I think, as Bart has just said in his introduction, really depends on who takes responsibility for making it so. And in my experience, um, when faced with this productivity puzzle, many people go searching for explanations. But too often, those explanations don't actually provide uh, pr practical, attractive and actionable solutions that people can really implement. You know, often what happens is they, you know, the work that's done essentially amounts to pointing out what somebody else should have done uh, uh, or should be doing. You know, common examples uh, include you know, that it's cyclical, uh, it's something to do with dominant sectors losing their mojo, uh, it's just a hangover from the financial crisis, uh, and perhaps it's something to do with technology, and, and you probably have some of your own uh, uh, things you could add to that list. And the truth is that we've, um, all those, those things have played a part in, in what's happened. But the analysis and the practice that we've done at Be The Business suggests that much of the answer or rather the opportunity to find practical and actionable solutions lies a lot closer to home. You know, it actually lies in the hands of business leaders up and down the country uh, of all shapes and sizes. And so with that in mind, I want to tell you about a fabulous business. Um, it's called Cars Pasties of Bolton. And Cars is a third generation family firm. Joe Carr founded the business back in 1938. Uh, it's a really famous business in Bolton. Um, when John, who's Joe's son, died in 2018, uh, there was a tribute paid to him at Bolton Wanderers. So as the name suggests, cars make pasties uh, and they sell those through three shops in Bolton uh, and direct to Boltonians wherever they want are uh, and they want to taste uh, a taste from home. And today, Cars is run by John's three sons, Matt, Joe, and Liam. And in the last five years, they've gone from making around 8,000 pasties a day uh, to making over 15,000 a day. They've completely overhauled uh, their digital systems, and they've hired 40 more people. Uh, and the joke is that Bolton's finest are now exporting to Manchester. But joking apart, <clears throat> they're actually shipping frozen pasties all across the UK. You can order the whole range. I, I needed to tell you this. Matt asked me to make sure I mentioned uh, mentioned all of it. Uh, you can you can you can order all of their range from the original meat and potato pasty right through to the cheese and jalapeno, uh, direct from their website, uh, and that went live in 2020, partly in response to COVID, uh, which forced the first closure of their shops in over 80 years. Now, for me, that is productivity. You know, it's about growth. It's about export. It's about investment, new channels, innovation, employment, skill development, and wages, uh, which uh, is, is so important. Um, but the interesting question, I think, that we should be thinking about is, is what led to this? How, how did this happen? Uh, we'd probably all like to see more businesses like cars up and down the country doing that. And at Be The Business, over the course of the last uh, three years or so, we've worked with around 11,000 businesses, including cars. And one of the things that's come up, which is um, surprisingly simple, is that while they're all very different, they actually share some common characteristics. Now, most of these businesses are run by leaders who are honestly some of the most accountable, committed, and busy people you are ever, ever likely to meet. In fact, they're so busy that after they've met, for example, with one of our mentors or some of the other people helping with business uh, for the first time, perhaps for a coffee or a drink or something, with extraordinary consistency, so many of them say words to the following effect. He said, you know, that is about as long as I've actually stopped and talked about my business for as long as I can remember. And the reality is that these people step up every day they take accountability, they take responsibility, but they're often so busy that they end up working in the business rather than on it. And if Matt Carr were here, he would tell you that the key to their recent changes has been that they took the time to step back, that the three brothers took the time to step back and say, what does Carr stand for? 
uh, and what do they want to, where do they want to take it? You know, they talked about the quality of their customer service being just as important as the products that they make. And they understood that their strategy needed to be really clear. So they had a good direction. They understood that they needed to have a good management team and they needed to invest in the training and give them the autonomy so that they could perform. And they also felt that their, way, their employees should be paid a decent wage and their lowest staff, uh, lowest paid staff are due to reach uh, the real living wage in 2021. And when you meet them, they talk an awful lot about family and about community. You know, it, and, and I'm not talking about the brothers as such, the actual familial family of cars, but it's the people they work with. It's the suppliers they've sourced potatoes from for generations. It's the families they actually serve. And essentially, they decided to work on the business, not just in it, not just for them, but particularly on behalf of the wider cars family. And now making that decision to work on your business uh, and creating the space and the support to do it is actually a very simple and a very human thing to do. And it's key in my belief to unlocking the vast economic potential that there is from boosting productivity and the benefits that can flow from that to society. Um, you'll be pleased to hear too, given, especially given some of the esteemed colleagues on the call, that, uh, that there's also some really great science behind this. You know, when researchers, including the likes of John Van Rienen, at the LSE and many of the academic scholars uh, who were involved with the Productivity, Productivity Institute, when they've looked into the causes of the productivity puzzle, they've actually found, again, pretty consistently that leadership and management and tech adoption, or rather the lack of it, uh, are a big part of the answer. So, and don't assume that in identifying leadership and management uh, as a key lever, that that's a judgment on the quality of the leadership in small and mid-sized businesses. It really, really isn't. Now, for a start, the research applies across all sizes of businesses, in fact, not just small and mid-sized businesses. And when it comes to those small and mid-sized businesses, they're some of the best and most motivated leaders I've honestly have ever met. Uh, and instead, it's not really a question of them not having or taking the time to see opportunities and not having it's and, and not having access. It's, it's, sorry, it's more about them not having the time to stop and see opportunities and also not always having the ready access to the kind of support that many other larger businesses have that help them uh, to do that kind of thing. And when it comes to support, it's worth uh, noticing, noticing that in the UK, we actually have uh, some of the finest professional services firms anywhere in the world. You know, the universities, business schools, professional services firms, consulting firms, all of them. And yet most of them, or many of them, are largely inaccessible. Uh, and often they actually focus relatively little on this group of business leaders where their impact might be really very great indeed. And what we found at Be The Business is that when you do focus on these people, actually this is an eminently addressable market. You know, by engaging the customer, by nurturing some relationships and with just a little bit of support, we can make a huge, huge difference. In fact, we estimate that based on the work that we've done with those 11,000 businesses so far, uh, that the value add that we've seen is in the order of, of 350 million pounds. Now that's with, uh, that's with 11,000 businesses out of a total addressable market of 510,000. And that's essentially why I believe that we really can resolve this puzzle and we can do a lot better when it comes to productivity. And also, we're really just getting started on this journey. Uh, I've already mentioned tech adoption and our analysis of, uh, of tech adoption in the UK suggests that there's a marked level of lack of adoption of technologies that can make a huge difference to productivity. And here, I'm not talking about advanced tech like AI. Uh, actually, it's things like um, online accounting, like eCRM or eHR uh, packages. Uh, and actually, until there was a surge of adoption prompted by COVID, it was also in part about online selling even. But when you dig behind it, it's actually not that surprising that there hasn't been as much tech adoption as you might have thought. Because some of the other research we've done shows that as many as 50% of the tech adoptions or the adoptions of tech that are carried out by businesses actually fail to achieve what they set out to accomplish. So if you take that business leader who's really busy, who's got loads of things on, and they've got loads of things they could go and spend their time working on, you know, if you were one of those people, would you choose to spend tens of thousands of pounds on a tech adoption with only a 50-50 chance of it succeeding? Now, and I bet you many people on the call would probably say, you know what, probably not. So uh, there's, a, there's a pretty good reason for it. Um, add to that, that many of the, uh, the world's finest technology businesses actually don't really address this customer base very well. 
uh, as an example, the, the world's leading provider of one of the most proven technologies that can make the biggest difference to productivity. Until very, very recently, they had no model to serve customers unless those customers were spending in the region of a million pounds a year in terms of fees or license agreements with that company. So at a stroke, you, you wipe out over 99% of, of UK businesses from having sort of proper customer success support in terms of using that technology. Um, what is, but the good news is that this, this adds up to a huge opportunity. And the fact there are these gaps means there's an awful lot for us to go for. Uh, and I think it is entirely feasible. When we really got started within Be The Business, uh, we managed to get a, a pro bono team from McKinsey for a few months, which was very helpful. Uh, and the analysis they did indicates that by making fairly small improvements in productivity, we could unlock over a hundred billion pounds of additional GVA for the economy uh, each year. Uh, and just to sort of give you a little bit of the behind what's behind that, <clears throat> that's what would be unlocked if the bottom 70% of firms uh, achieved a 10 percentage point improvement in their productivity. So it's not about saying that, you know, I don't know, the bottom quartile, I've got to go to the top quartile. This is actually about saying that if there's a firm at say the 42nd percentile, they've got to get to the 52nd percentile, which is the level that's already being achieved by a firm of a similar size in their same sector. So it really is about marginal improvements, uh, but aggregated up over a large body of businesses, uh, the potential economic benefit are, is, is in fact huge. Now, what's also worth noting is that shocks help um, in fact, I mean, they have some huge damaging effects, but, but during the last year, small businesses have come a very, very long way in terms of discovering, rediscovering and adopting technology, sometimes out of you know, force of hand. Um, some analysis that we did showed that there was something in the region of three years worth of tech adoption, tech innovation uh, crammed into the first three months of the pandemic, which I think just shows when you get, you get the motivation right, you get the attention focused on these things, it just shows how much can change and how quickly. And I'm really pleased to say that the government has made this a focus of building back better. Help to Grow, which was announced uh, at the budget in March, commits £520 million to supporting the development of leadership and tech adoption among small and mid-sized uh, businesses. Now, that is great news because some resources are being provided to, to focus on this. And we at Be The Business are seeking to work closely with the government to help them to make sure that that's applied well and it works better. But I also want to point out that it carries a risk. And the risk is this, that we outside government effectively become bystanders uh, in this mission, in this challenge, either by accident or by design or even by choice. Now, uh, it is sadly the case that in today's world to get elected, politicians have to tell us that they are going to solve all the deepest and most trenchant problems that we face uh, in, our, in our society and our countries. If you take leveling up as an example, you know, look, it's persistent and it's generational, it's structural and it's cyclical, it's varied and it's complex, you know, and it's all going to get resolved in a few years. But you know, it's therefore hardly surprising that sometimes they fall short and it's easy and it, it's perhaps just a little bit tempting sometimes to stand back from that and say, well, good luck with that. We'll see how you get on. Yeah, that might even seem like the, the least risky thing to do for, for many of us who, who, can, who don't have to get our hands dirty with it. But the fact is that the most complex and difficult issues that we face are often those that need the most collaborative response. And if we don't engage, aside from some fleeting schadenfreude, uh, we'll all actually end up being much poorer for that. So my message really to businesses, to business representative organizations, to universities, sectors, concerned individuals is get stuck in. You know, and in that context, the formation of the Institute, I think is a very promising uh, sign. You know, with five years of committed funding, it should be a catalyst for anyone who wants to be part of figuring out how we can unlock this prize. And so my encouragement to you and to the Institute is to, uh, is to participate as much as we can in that connected work and to focus as much as possible in that work on finding practical solutions, as well as just explaining or understanding the problem. And in that vein, I'd just like to mention one thing uh, before I finish, which is that uh, at Be The Business, Anthony MP, who's our CEO, himself a successful entrepreneur, he often says how it drives him nuts that people use this, this phrase SME, because at a stroke, we classify a vast and varied range of businesses, all hugely different and interesting and dynamic. 
And it really does every single one of them some kind of disservice just to sort of classify these, these, this huge part of our economy. Remember, these people employ nearly two thirds of the people who work in the UK. So a few months ago, um, a wonderful lady called Shani Elcock in Anthony's team uh, was asked to do some work to see if we could do a little bit better. Uh, and she recently completed what we believe to be the largest and most robust study uh, of this audience to identify an attitudinal segmentation to figure out what the attitudinal and behavioral differences are between business leaders within that cohort. And the result is that we've got a predictive segmentation that classifies business leaders across six different leadership archetypes. Uh, and our first application of this work is being used to explore not just um, uh, is to explore how, how best to engage those different, different archetypes so that they can be encouraged to work on, not just in their businesses. And we're using things like A-B testing to determine uh, the effectiveness, the different conversion results that we can achieve from those different, uh, different areas. Now, we're publishing that full work in August, uh, and in the spirit of opening up our work for peer review and development, um, we've actually already published, oh, that's my timer to tell me that I need to, uh, my productivity window has closed, I'll be, I'll be very quick. Um, we're publishing a, a beta, which is actually already available now on our website, where you can find out what segment you are part of. And what I'd love you to do is to try it out. Um, uh, you'll be helping us to refine the segmentation. The more data we can get into it, the better. Uh, and you also might find out something that's really helpful about your own leadership approach. So please have a, have a look at that. Now, we're also using some of this work uh, across leadership and management and tech adoption to engage some of the UK's largest businesses, you know, those who want to be a part of this movement rather than just bystanders looking on. And I'm pleased to say that we've already got great partnerships with businesses such as Lloyds Bank, uh, BAE Systems, Cisco, Facebook, MasterCard, Shopify, and, and, and several others. And, and they all want to make a difference. And essentially what we're doing is we're using the tools and the insights that we've generated from working with all those businesses over the last three years to help them to have a greater impact on reaching parts and businesses and regions that people are, that otherwise might be missed in this movement to raise productivity overall. We, I'm sure, would all love to see more businesses like cars, and, and we honestly believe that the best way to achieve that is through collaborating and convening those who are best able to make a difference to actually do so. And in that vein, the Productivity Institute provides a timely opportunity that's really bringing together some of the best academic scholars, business leaders, politicians, all sorts of people to tackle those issues. Uh, and in, by doing so, in engaging with the rich diversity of regions, of sectors, of different sizes of businesses, and creating an open house for all of those who care about this, uh, it's a massive, massive opportunity. So please do jump, jump in and join us uh, on this journey. Thank you very much. So Charlie, thank you so much for what I think is a really inspiring way to get us going today and bringing the productivity topic so much to life. And uh, I would love to talk to you and ask you hundreds of questions, but uh, I know that our panelists and our other speakers this morning will actually follow up on some of the things you're saying. So I'm just gonna leave it with one question to close off this part. Uh, one of the most interesting things, we've had many interesting, but one really interesting phrase you mentioned is you need as a business leader to work not just in your business, but on your business. And you need to step back from your business and take time and think where you're heading. And this really goes into the topic of short-termism versus long-termism. And of course, there's a lot of talk these days that we need to focus on ESG goals, uh, goals right, and, and environment, sustainability, governance, social. Um, and this is really hard to do. So, so can you give us you know, one piece of advice for business leaders on how can you move from the short-termism to the long-termism? How can you avoid the trap of continuously getting thrown back at the day-to-day -day pressures and stay on the business as well? Because I think that's one of the really big pressures that, that business leaders are facing every day. So I think, first of all, I mean, I do think there's something simple about stepping back and recognize, giving yourself the time and the space to see what's going on so you can appreciate it. Uh, I mean, it, it's so often businesses, they don't actually succeed and fail on the basis of how they trade today. They succeed or fail on the basis of, of the, how, how well they identify trends and changes in their environment that they then adapt to or respond to or even proactively, hopefully, uh, to get ahead of them. So that is the, the single most uh, important uh, thing that they, uh, they need to do. Um, I mean, in terms of sort of practical advice, I mean, one is talking to other people is really helpful. So to, making the time to talk to other people about what's going on, literally asking that question is really useful. 
The second thing I would say, though, is also bear in mind the, uh, the your own experience as a business leader can not serve you well in that mission. You know, most people who become leaders of businesses have done so because they've succeeded in running their business through a, over a period of time and they've perhaps been promoted or they've succeeded with a few things. And, and it's natural as a human being to think that therefore, you know, if that's worked for you before, you just do it again and it'll work for you again. And of course, there's some truth in that, certainly in the short term. Um, but it can also lead to a situation where you believe that you can trade your way out of a, a fundamentally changing environment. I, I've seen that in a retail context where people think they can somehow, if I have a better Christmas next year, it'll all be okay the year after. When in fact, what they're not seeing is that there's a trend going on, which is going to defeat all of those, 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 those efforts, good though they may be uh, in the long run. So really thinking about how you, can, um, how you can create the space, stand back, talk to other people and be aware that your own experience can sometimes serve you, serve you poorly when you're thinking about long-term strategy. Great. Well, thank you again for all these very important words, and they will be with us uh, for the remainder of this uh, of this event today. I hope you will have some time to stay with us as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, of course, we look forward very much to engage with you and with the business in going forward.